Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, today I'm going to be looking at the presence of Sir Isaac Newton and William Blake's Europa Prophecy. Now, um, we're all sort of familiar with Isaac Newton as the man who discovered gravity, right? But, you know, this was actually a really big scientific achievement, right? And it had effects that existed beyond the scientific realm. Right, it very much affected the politics of the Enlightenment, you know. And in that sense, you know, when we're considering William Blake's Europe of Prophecy, right, it is very uh, involved with and engaging with some of the, the ideas that Isaac Newton sort of created. So, what did William Blake think of Isaac Newton? Um, William Blake actually makes an illustration of Isaac Newton called uh, Newton, I believe, and I can link it below. But um, basically in this picture, we have uh, Isaac Newton sitting on a rock, intensely absorbed into this piece of paper, right? And in his hands, he's holding a compass and he's sort of like interacting with the paper using the compass. And he's so absorbed in the paper that he totally misses out on the sort of splendors and beauty of the rock that he's sitting on, right? So the rock is drawn with like absolutely wonderful detail and beautiful colors, right? And what William Blake was getting at here was sort of criticizing science's reductive approach in that it limits, you know, sort of the infinitudes and splendors of the world through imposing this rigid order upon it, right? Um, in that sense, you know, this also like draws parallels to Urizen, right? Because in his hands, um, Isaac Newton is holding a compass. And what do we see in the first plate of Europa Prophecy? Urizen is also holding a compass, you know? So there's this sort of innate connection between reason and between the two characters, right? So, but who, what exactly were the effects of Isaac Newton on the Enlightenment? You know, the setting for Europa Prophecy. Right, well, at this time, Isaac Newton's uh, book, Principia, uh, was widely read, you know, sort of by all educated members of society. And in Principia, this uh, book detailed Isaac Newton's discovery of gravity, right? And the important sort of notion behind this, like the discovery of gravity, was that it encouraged the idea that there was sort of this singular law governing and structuring the entirety of the world, right? No one, king or pauper, was above the law of gravity, you know? And in this sense, we see the beginnings of natural rights, right? Because just as we have, like, one single law that governs the universe, so too must society be governed by a singular law. You know, just as how no man or commoner is above the law of gravity, the same can be said for law itself, right? And sort of this idea that, you know, natural law, right? The way that nature is governed ought to be how humans ought to act, right? So this sort of because of Isaac Newton, you know, we see astronomy start to become political, right? And you had a lot of thinkers like Voltaire and Rousseau, you know, important Enlightenment thinkers and philosophers who, um, took up this idea and started to use it as a foundation for what would, you know, eventually lead to becoming the French Revolution, right? So, where does Isaac Newton actually pop up in um, Europe of Prophecy? And now it's time for our quote, you know? So, I'll read out loud here. A mighty spirit leaped from the land of Albion, named Newton. He seized the trump and blowed the enormous blast Yellow as leaves of autumn, the myriads of an angelic hosts fell through the wintry skies seeking their graves, rattling their hollow bones and howling in lamentation. Then Antheramon woke, nor knew that she had slept, and 1800 years were fled as if they had not been. Right? So um, it's really interesting to consider Newton here as the being responsible for waking up Antheramon, right? Um, because in this sense, he is, um, sort of ushering human beings into existence, right? We have like the line, um, 1800 years were fled as if they had not been, 
That is until like in Thirmon awoke, you know, it's almost like humans weren't living, right? And we see this sort of like through like the very um, apocalyptic, you know, images and illustrations throughout the um, the text, right? With the humans like being like bound and shackles and all these sorts of things, right? So it's very interesting that like William Blake, despise, despite criticizing Newton and scientific reason, um, has Newton as the force waking in theorem, right? Because, um, yeah, and in this sense too, Newton sort of as representing astronomy itself, we see the celestial imagery pop up all over the place, right? We have um, on plate 14, waking the stars of Urizen with their immortal songs, right? So we're relating stars to Urizen. And then on plate 13, and loss, possessor of the moon, joyed in the peaceful night. Um, anyways, yeah, so in that sense, we have like loss as this possessor of the moon, again, relating him to celestial imagery. And at the very end of the, um, of Europa prophecy, loss is also the one responsible for sort of like calling his sons into actions and starting the revolution, right? Now, personally, what I think this might be sort of pointing to is, um, on one sense, you have like Urizen representing this sort of like scientific reason that was very much like a means of domination, right? That was a terrible thing up until the Enlightenment and the revolution occurred. However, um, inherent to that revolution, you also have like these principles of like an intense reason, right? That um, similarly, you know, but like lead to these flames that consume themselves right and sort of this idea of like the serpent that eats its tail right and in that sense um you know another like really interesting thing i'd like to point out is the very first two plates of um europe of prophecy begin with on the one we have horizon right sort of like in this god like figure creating the world from up above and the second panel you have orc uh, represented as the serpent looking up now, one way to interpret that could be that we have orc, in some sense, revolution being created by the limiting figure of Urizen, right? And in that sense, um, reason that Urizen represents is also inherent to the revolution. You know, it's sort of like it's always haunted, like revolution is always haunted by reason, you know, or at least it was in the case of the French Revolution, right? And even in this like freeing action you know of humans coming into being right it's still haunted by the reason that's inherent to it right it's still haunted by isaac newton you know so yeah these are just some ideas i hope this was helpful and um yeah thank you for watching